It's a matter of life. And death. It's 007. My name's Bond. James Bond. It's deadlier. It's livelier. It's live and let die. Rated PG. Welcome to the James Bond Complex. I am Matt. And my name is Edgar. We are doing Live and Let Die, the movie. Say live and let die. Yeah, so it's 1973. We're going to talk about the film. I made sure to verify if the credits said Roger Moore as Yan Fleming's James Bond in Live and Let Die or Yan Fleming's mm -hmm. Live and Let Die. And this one says in Yan Fleming's Live and Let Die. And yeah, that's not very accurate, actually. <laughs> For many reasons, we will get into. So I'll start with the plot. Insomnia, sir. Instructions. Three MI6 agents are murdered while investigating the connection between American gangster Mr. Big and the president of San Monique, Dr. Kananga. James Bond's mission is to discover what his fellow agents had discovered. His investigation leads him from Harlem to Jamaica, back to the States in New Orleans. Thanks to the help of Solitaire, Kananga's fortune teller and consigliere, Bond discovers that Mr. Big is in fact Kananga himself, and that the dictator plans to flood the United States with free heroin in order to gain new customers that he can sell his poisons to. After confronting the drug kingpin in his lair, 007 finally blows up his adversary, avoids a final attempt on his life, and goes to bed with solitary as credits roll. Yeah, for a, for a plot that's a little bit convoluted, on the, <laughs> as, as many Bond films are, in fairness. Not, not a whole lot of them are as simple as like uh, Casino Royale or... Uh... Or it's, License to Kill. It's not very straightforward. There's a, it, there's a lot of twists and turns that are just for the sake of action for action's mm, sake. Yeah. I think when you've seen the franchise in its whole and all the individual installments, certainly the number of times people like you and I have mm -hmm. seen them, after a while, you, you sort of come to expect that the franchise just tries to do different things depending on the decade, depending on the actor playing Bond or, or maybe the people writing and directing the movies. I'm not the first one to use this term many people have said it this is like black exploitation bond and i don't think if i've heard about them but it uh, shaft i've seen the the remakes uh, um that with samuel jackson i've seen the uh, you gotta see the original you should check out a couple um uh, pam greer films as well coffee, yeah, coffee foxy cleopatra they're a lot of fun <laughs> so they are we start we're starting to see that the producers are rather than being inventive although i mean there's a lot of great stuff in the movie but instead of being p completely inventive and, and and original they are sort of riding the on the coattails of of a movement they're catching up they're trying to catch up to the times and instead of being their own thing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and as live and let die is being made they couldn't um, keep George Lazenby as Bond. He convinced uh, Sean Connery to come back for one movie. That movie was a success somewhat. Mm. Well, anytime you make money, it's a success. Artistically, it's certainly a downgrade from on, it's, uh, from Majesty's. Yeah, it's it's it's. Uh, it's time to change actors. They don't have a choice anymore, and they have to to make a successful transition. And they got Roger Moore. He's not the, a weak point in this movie. He's not as comfortable in the role as he's gonna be in later installments. But it's he's still fun to watch. You can see where uh, he comes up with his own lines, mm. his own oh. jokes. Oh, there's some. <sighs> I'm going to be going to bat a lot for this movie. There are some lines in this film that if I get an opportunity to say them, and I have had opportunities <laughs> to use them in my real life, I'm going for it. I'm, I'm using some live and let die lines. Oh, no, I know. I wrote down a few uh, choice uh, lines here and there. And I'm, I love the way he just mocks the uh, henchmen from time to time, especially T. Ah, the diesel valve. He's a crop. Got over careless with him some time back, and he took my whole arm off. Well done, Albert. Uh, later on in the movie, I love these interactions with the villains and the way he just laughs at them. They're, they're going to cut his fingers off, and he's still mocking them. I just love them. Funny oh. how the least little thing seems to amuse him as he throws his bent pistol into the garbage bin. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's, that, 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 that's a great moment. Mm, sure we can lick you into shape, darling? Going to be completely useless. 
useless to you. Oh, sure we'd be able to lick you into shape. <laughs> Rosie, ca- ah, ca- that lick you into shape, darling. I've, I may or may not have used that one in the past. Uh, I will not reveal if it was successful or not. <laughs> but uh, no, Roger is just, and obviously, you know, it's 2017. We're just a few months after his passing. So it's obviously, it's very easy to get, you know, emotional and, and give him a pass, so to speak. I've always genuinely liked his Bond. He, he wasn't an obvious choice. He's not a tough guy. He's certainly different. He's very different from Sean. But funnily enough, this when they approached him for Live and Let Die, it was not the first time the producers approached him. No, they approached him for Her Majesties, too, from what I read. He's older than Sean Connery, too. When I learned that, it shocked me. He looks like he's about five to ten years younger than yeah. Sean Connery was when he quit the part. I think that's because... He does look so much older in the later films that when you go back to Live and Let Die, he looks so youthful. But yeah, the guy's like 44, 45 years old in Live and Let Die. He's not a spring chicken. No. But he looks it because, well, at some Could, point in the future, we'll get to a view to a kill, but he looks so old in that one. He kept his youthful vitality as long as he could. In this one, it's it's staggering. He looks like a boy at times. So as, like far, a- as far as the looks go, you understand why they hired him as no, James Bond. It, but I, thankfully... He's not a bad actor either. I think he's pretty good in this. It started with Diamonds and Are Forever, but it's more evident with uh, Live and Let Die. The series is, be- is becoming more a parody of itself. For better or worse, it is. Bond fans, that is, will sometimes use the term the, the Mankovitz trilogy. Uh, Tom Mankovitz, who wrote the Diamond script, the Live and Let Die script, and I think he had a... If he's not the sole creditor on Golden Gun, he certainly wrote the original draft of Golden Gun. I, I-, I think Roger is delightful. It- it's weird... I know we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. We want to stick to this movie. But funnily enough, I think his his live and let die bond and his spy who loved me bond are similar. I I, it's, I feel it's the golden gun bond where they try to make, oh no, let's let's make him like Sean. I don't, do you get that feeling from live and let die? I don't, I don't. I saw it last night for the eighth, ninth, 10th, 11th time in my life, maybe 12th time. I feel like I'm watching a Roger Bond. Yes and no. There's not the one scene in um The Man With the Golden Gun where it really feels like they're writing the story for Sean Connery and they're putting Roger Moore in it and it's disturbing when he he meets uh, what's your Miss, name Miss Sanders Miss Sanders I when, didn't recognize you with your clothes on but that's before uh, before then when he twists her arm when he twists that's her arm a that's, a, scene. that's a Sean Connery move there's nothing like that at first glance the sleeping with solitaire and it was, it's a bit Roger Moore-esque but his bond the, sleeps around a lot oh no he, he's he's Covered in STDs from head to toe. I think his reaction to... I, there's something there that's more m- more Sean Curry than more. I don't know. I'm trying mm. to see... Because violent. he's never violent towards yes. her. He never, never sl- slaps her around. He is, despite uh, him having tricked her into, into sleeping with him. When they're in bed, we're in that scene, you know, after she's she's gone on blabbering about the high priestess the prince of another world and he's like what the heck is going on um you know he has a moment um that connery has he, he kind of goes oh i i did this for my country kind of thing when he's like d- getting dressed and he's gonna go investigate and it's like okay mm-hmm. yeah you you stay there the, like yeah, a, there is that moment where he's like well she's not gonna give me any information i need i'm getting the hell out of here <laughs> there's yeah. that moment yeah it's, it's true it, uh, but you gotta be bond also i mean this is also one of the criticisms of the character certainly in our in our day and age where we, we try to be a little bit more sensitive about the about these things that's a very bondian thing to do well this was fun uh, what information can you give me? Oh, nothing. <laughs> well, ta-ta. You know, yeah, he does get up and go. But I do like that little moment where you know she, Solitaire is very distraught. Uh, she she was a virgin prior to this night, and uh, we're led to believe that it is in part her virginity that provided her with these this power to read the tarot cards and somewhat see into the future. And she's very distraught because she can't read the cards anymore. And you know, Roger, I love Roger. He snuggles over and says, "Darling, uh, try not to get." too angry with me but the stack uh, the cards were slightly stacked in my favor <laughs> you know sean wouldn't do that no roger does that so there's always a little bit of that balancing act you know it's like i kind i'm sorry i kind of fooled you on that one you know <laughs> he admits it i still liked it though but i'm sorry you the know? cards did you notice the 007 on top of the cards i've heard of that 
Uh, but I, I, I had to be told that. Uh, I, I will not deny the fact that I, I've certainly seen the movie a number of times before I, before I, I was told it. Not that I discovered. I cannot claim to have known it's, it. It's fairly noticeable. Because I yeah, but they're, sh- but they're shown for, yeah, I mean, Matthew's showing me a, a, a still of, of the, uh, but is that zoomed in? There's no shot of the no, movie th- th- that looks that's, like that. that's a still from the movie. You clearly see. Really? It. Yeah. And uh, if you want to buy the prop replica, you're going to have to shelve at least uh, $160 oh, plus shipping for cards, tarot cards. I think I'll... Uh... I'll, well, I'll start with that uh, that old Casino Royale DVD that came with the two stacks of Casino Royale. I'll start with that's about fifteen twenty bucks yeah, at this point. <laughs> maybe, maybe even less. Let's get the cards. But yeah, it, it, honestly, if it was ten bucks, I, I I would have twelve packs by now. Are you kidding me? I'd have eight pa- oh, twelve. Oh, I was about to say two. You beat me. No, forget it. I was gonna say two, so I can like have one untouched, unsullied, and another one that I can show off. <laughs> I'm learning to look. Uh, and one thing I. I love looking for things like that. The um, the, um, the espresso machine that he has uh, at the beginning of the movie, uh, it's a La Pavonie. Uh, and well, if you want one, do you know what? Do you want me to make you guess, or do you want me to just tell you how much it's worth? Can you act the the one he uses in the film? That is that still on the market today? It, I think so. I don't know. It's probably. It looks like the. It looks the same. It okay. looks the same to me. Uh, Maybe a more modern I, I version. Know um, well, I'm going to say, you know what? I know those things can get kind of expensive, so I'm going to say 300 bucks. Oh, God, you're so wrong. That barely covers shipping. What do you mean that barely covers shipping? Well, what, it's Canadi- kind of the freaking- Canadian Am- Amazon, so it might be different elsewhere, but it's the price that I found, $1,079. Shipping is 297 cents. Is it made of 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 crystal? What I is this thing? I don't know why it's. Well, there's 18 left in stock, so that could influence the price. But it's the same goddamn thing. Holy smoke! They put it in a, in a gold box. I, I, you know, the, the price of the machine is is preposterous. But I'm almost. I, I'm just as flabbergasted about the. Uh, Three hundred bucks for shipping? How big is this? It doesn't look that big. You see it in the it's movie. It's probably. Ridiculous. They probably make like 20 per year. Oh, professional espresso machine. I didn't read the title. That's oh. why it explains everything. <laughs> Just make it a double O espresso machine. Now you can charge $1,000 for it. <laughs> That's okay. It, I have no problem with that. Uh, yeah. If it has a 007 logo, you're going to buy it. Um, also, yeah, I wrote down a few things here because we didn't talk about the way that Roger makes his initial appearance the first time he appears on screen as James Bond. Mm. Like Sean Connery, they, they build up to it. You see his ends, and then the classic line, Bond, James Bond. They build up to George. Yeah, they did. They did. They He's built in the car. Up. You see his chin, that beautiful chin of his. He's smoking the cigarette in the car, and it's only one. He, I believe it's when he says, my name's Bond, James Bond, that you actually only see his face yeah. really for the first time. He's so happy as he says that. I love it every time. Yeah, we'll discuss. But I, I have my own Yeah, feelings, we got to we'll we'll, <laughs> I can't wait, but. There's a few more shows before uh, that one. I love Rod- Roger. I love Sean. I even love George. But Roger, the way he's introduced, he's just there. Just- uh, 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 uh. He's in bed with Miss Caruso I from know. the Italian job. I know, but there is no build up to it. Every other director that has directed the first appearance of a Bond actor, there's a build up to it. And this one is just right there. It's like there's, mm. and that's my main complaint. It's about- almost like it's not his introduction. This is like his second or third movie. Yeah. And that's my main complaint. My only complaint about this movie is the director. I'm not a fan of Guy Hamilton's effort and, and as James Bond. He made one good movie. Mind you, it's Goldfinger, so it's one of the best. Everything else that he's made is uh, mediocre at best. Yeah, and we also broached this a little bit before we hit record. I don't entirely disagree with you. I mean, the the thing is, we're not talking diamonds or golden gun today. We'll get to them. We, but it just so happens we're talking about the one other Hamilton film that I kind of like. You know, if if we if this was diamonds or golden gun, we'd maybe on a, on the same page. If, but if but if you know what, if I was going to rate them, I would put Goldfinger number one. I would actually agree with you. I'd put Live and Let Die in number two. I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm glad you are. <laughs> You know what? I, I I will agree with you in so far as again I like it. I'll even say I like it a lot. I watched it last night. It was maybe a little bit late, and my my weekend had been pretty exciting up until that point. So I was maybe a little tired, <laughs> but but it was one of the rare times where I felt the movie was teeny weeny bit long. Which, teeny which weeny. part? Which part? 
Um, I think that boat chase <laughs> can be trimmed a little bit. I think Thank it can you. be trimmed. <laughs> And you know what I noticed too? Jesus Christ. That boat chase like lasts like almost 20 it's a, minutes. It's, it's, it's incredibly too long. Well, it's like, well, it's multiple boats. He actually changes <sighs> boats once they, not when they crash the wedding, when the bad guys go into the swimming pool and he steals But the what you boat. don't know about Live and Let Die and none of our listeners know, it's actually a spinoff, a prequel to the Dukes of Hazzard. <laughs> sure. The entire time I was watching and like, Wow, this really reminds me of those shows and uh, Smoking the Bandit type of cars. Fun movie, but I see where you're coming from. And probably one of, not just the fact that we're down in the southern United States, but there's a particular character oh my God. that shows up. Now, Sheriff uh, J.W. Pepper. Oh. Uh, look. What's worse, the racism in the book or that character? Because you know that character today would be rejected by mass audiences. Worst thing is that they loved him so much, they brought him back for the sequel, well, the follow-up movie. Yeah, that's that's a little bit weird. Funnily enough, I think J.W. Pepper, if he had showed up for one or two scenes, a couple funny lines, it would have been okay. But the film keeps cutting back to him. You know what? That weird. comes back to my main complaint about this movie, the director. Obviously, love that actor. He loved them. He's giving it. You you know, it's one of those things. The actor's just doing what what he read on the page and what the director's saying. That is that's good. Cut print. He's just doing his job. Uh, the act the name uh, the actor's name escapes me. Clifton James. Clifton James. He's also he almost plays the same part in Superman too. I have to rewatch Superman too. It's been a while. Uh, like three Kryptonian to show up in Houston, Texas. Uh -huh. And the Isn't he one of the generals or he, something like that? He's not actually he's the cop. He, he, <laughs> he's he first the cop. Meet, he, they first meet a um, couple of cops, and he's like the sheriff of the, t of the town. I might be mistaken, but I'm ninety nine percent sure it's him. What? Well, see, th that's where that, again you, you're wrong again about living or die. He's such he's so good at playing that role that they brought him back not just for another Bond film. No, 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 no. They brought him back to play a summer character in a Superman movie. I, I'm not gonna lie, I do get a kick out of the at the, finally at the end of this boat chase. It's not a bad chase, but it is too long. And it's overindulgent. It's over. That's actually the a very good way of describing it. And you know, he's you got you some kind of doomsday machine boy. And then one of his colleagues pulls him over. You know this this boy is from <laughs> London and he's working with our boys. It's he's a little bit. Agent. It's a little bit funny. Like there's secret agent. On whose side? <laughs> like that makes me laugh. But he is in the movie too much. He's in the movie too much. Not, he was not good enough to bring back, especially no. in the sequel where it makes no sense. In a country like we just saw him take the greatest pleasure in arresting black people. What is he doing in Thailand? How can he afford on his salary to go to Thailand? <sighs> No idea. W was he paid by the British to keep to shut up and uh, <laughs> we're gonna pay for his vacation? I tell you another thing. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm being hypocritical here because I keep saying I like the movie a lot. But another thing that I find a little weird is the whole Mr. Big is, or actually the other way around. I, Dr. Kananga is Mr. Big. Like, why aren't those two different characters? Like, what is the deal there? What, what the, does that plot not work if they're actually two different characters? I don't understand that part. I was rewatching it. I'm like, yeah, you don't get a good look at Mr. Big, but when you do, it's, <laughs> it's clearly visible. You have an excellent note when you uh, went for a PP break or something. Uh, I, I read your notes. He looks like a burnt victim or something. Yes, like that. he yeah. does. It's pretty terrible makeup. It's, I'm shocked. It's, it's embarrassing. Um, that being said, we showered uh, Roger with some some praise. I, I like him a lot. I gotta say, whether it's in this movie or or in any other ones he shows up, I've always been a big Yafet Koto fan. I love them. He's great. He's good as Kananga. It's he, it's it's weird that there hasn't been a black James Bond villain since him. Like yeah, the it's lead true. villain, there's never been. And there's a lot, especially right now. Like you mentioned, um, sh they, they, would, they should make more movies where black people are the bad guys. <laughs> not black people, but. <laughs> It, uh, 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 I see what you mean. Villains of, of vari various mm. uh, ethnic uh, ethnicities. Uh, ethnicities. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the last time Bond faced off against a villain of uh, uh, anything but white, Gustav Graves is actually called Moon. 
it, that's like the best and worst example at the same time. <laughs> but Yafet Koto is great. And I do feel as though, and I think what helped is the fact that I, I watched the movie last night and I finished reading the book Tuesday or Wednesday night, something like that. And yesterday was Saturday. I find that Yafet Koto, although he doesn't have the stature of the Mr. Big from the book, I do find he's behaving. Like he's, he's very well spoken. He's, he's very calm, well organized, he's, uh, very calm, very self-assured, but not in a provocative way. It's not exactly the same character, but I do feel like they did try to inject sort of that quiet genius, that quiet confidence into the character. He's not maniacal, really. You know, I... I in, in my research, I was trying to find because he's not he's not the character of the book, obviously. And I googled something to see if there there were other drug dealers in the sixties, seventies, and there's Frank Lucas. It doesn't the, the timeline doesn't fit for him to be the main inspiration, but he was a drug dealer. They made a movie with um, Denzel Washington, the American gangster. Oh, that's that guy. Okay. And I was like, maybe it's him, but I'm like, no, that doesn't fit. And a little bit later, no? Yeah, or maybe actually, at the same time? I don't know the same time. So maybe it was, he might have made the news somehow. But you know who I, I'm certain he's the main inspiration was uh, Papa Duck. Oh, uh, that's a dictator. That's and, actually uh, on AT. I, 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 I Asian dictator. Yeah. And he was actually a doctor. So it's <laughs> it's obvious that and he's, people compare him to Baron Sandy. So it's almost like he was actually the real life mm. Mr. Big. So I, I think he might have been the main inspiration. I mean, and um, Tom McGuinness has passed away. We can't uh, ask him those questions. Bless but his I'm heart. Pretty sure that's that's what they were going for. I mean, could be, could be. I mean, they can't uh, they can't put all the bits of information into these behind the scenes books. And I've read a few, but that's I've never read that, but that's my theory. I mean, but it's not a bad theory. I I kind of agree with it. Actually, it's probably not that difficult to imagine either. I, you know, Doctor Kanana, small Caribbean island. Like it does kind of fit. It, it does fits. kind of fit. Um, so Yafet Koto, alien uh, across 110th Street. I mean, just a great actor, but he is a really cool uh, villain. I, I like how he um, he seems to appreciate Bond guessing what his plan is. Like, oh. I'm, Sure, you just give it away for free on the streets. Exactly, Mr. Bond. Yes. Exactly. It'll drop them positively out of the mines. Like he's really enjoying that. You're right, Bond. That's exactly what I'm going to I, 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 You're almost as smart as me. Yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> he acknowledges Bond's abilities, and he's like, oh, there you, you good boy, good boy. Absolutely. I, I, his dialogue is, is, is very good, too. Uh, the question still stands. To the gentleman concerned, I would expect Solitaire to be no less the lady. Like, he speaks really cool way. I do like him a lot. We get some other pretty awesome... I love the henchmen. All, all the henchmen are amazing. They're pretty freaking awesome. I need I need to... Wait. I need to show you Jeffrey uh, Holder, the guy, the, the, the actor who plays... Uh, He's a dan professional dancer. Uh, prof made most of his career through dancing. I think that was his first love. Marvelous, absolutely marvelous. Just try making something like that out of a cooler nut. Why, it's even prettier than a cooler. Nuttier than a cooler, actually. <laughs> so yeah, great laugh again. So good. Did you know that so he made so? He made a series of uh, commercials. I had seen a few of them. There's there's a YouTube channel. I think it's called No Small Parts, and it's this guy. He does these you know ten to fifteen minute mini documentaries on the lives of, of artists and actors who, I uh, you know them, but you don't really know them. And he did one on on um, Jeffrey Holder. Jeffrey Holder, and uh, you know that's that's where I've sort of learned that okay, this guy's not really an actor. He's a dancer and actor. But they did talk a bit about the sprite He's commercials. That scene. Where he and a Bond, he Bond and Solitaire, they've slept together. Now it's the next morning. Then they pass through a little graveyard. And oh my the flute. god! You know, oh, it's gonna be a beautiful day. <laughs> beautiful day. And then they walk away. Scott continues playing the flute, and there's a little microphone in the flute. They are heading for the hill. They're heading for the hill. There is one other character. Oh, I'm sorry, tons of characters, and you can add some more. But the one we don't see him too much. But I get a kick every time he shows up. Hey, Jim, what's shaking, baby? The, Relax. The cab driver. The cab driver. Oh my God. I hope you would mention him. He's awesome. For an extra twenty bucks, I'll drive you straight to a Ku Klux Klan cookout, and Bond's giving him the eye like, "What is this Joker <laughs> doing here? Uh, he heading on in. 
God, I love that. He's not a character. He's a caricature, in fairness. But holy smokes. Brings a fun funny. energy. Oh, God. Now he's great. We haven't... We've gone through the we've gone through Bond we've gone through the, the, the litany of, of, of antagonists in this and we haven't talked about the Bond girl. <laughs> yeah, well, she was twenty two. Jane introducing Jane Seymour. I, I'm having trouble here because because what you point out is fair. It's mathematical. She could only be twenty one or twenty two. I was watching the film last night. I've already said, and I was reminded, you know, and I'm I'm in my early thirties. I'm not like a spring chicken anymore. And but. Mm. Mm. Even to this day, Jean, Sa- oh, yes. Jean-, Jean Seymour, she's a beautiful, beautiful, uh, mature woman, but she's just as beautiful. Call today. the doctor. The Dr. Quinn Medicine. She's a Dr. Quinn Medicine. She call her up. I'm feeling sick. Get the doctor. <laughs> no, she's a beautiful, she's a very good actress. I don't know if she's very good in this. I think she's doing basically what the script is asking yeah, of her. Um, She's maybe even a little bit because in the book we get that background on her, so we sort of I, understand her, but we don't get that she's, background. She's really. a worse character in the movie. I'm sorry. Well, how, didn't we just spend 20 minutes blasting? Say, is this uh, GW Peppa? You can't call her the worst character. In the movie. Oh, no, no, Peppa's the worst character. No, I said she's worse, or the version that she uh, from the novel is better than the version in the movie. Yeah, M- maybe not by leaps and bounds, but she's she, she feels a little bit more complete in the book. Yes. Whereas here, she really is just the damsel in distress she's a prop she's literally a prop that they they bring from one location to the other she is the she becomes a MacGuffin near the end of the movie she's a thing that Bond has to save but she is close to um, the what's the name of the character in A View to a Kill oh Stacey Sutton she's close to her (laughs) She's probably the least annoying of the most annoying. One of the things mm. she feels incomplete. Not only in the book do we get the backstory, but in because the voodooism is so much more prominent in the book. Once it becomes, once she's taken away from Mister B- or taken away, taken back, this and that, it seems to be a bigger threat to Mister Big in the book because he needs that aura, that image of I'm the voodoo master and here is my mind reader. In the book, that never really comes into play like he's 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 angry that she betrayed him but you know whatever. he's angry because he uh, gives her a good slap you know i would have given you love if you'd asked me to but or when the time came or whatever the line is but that's pretty much it you yeah know? He, he'll, he'll kill her it's fine again jane seymour was a a and still is a, an astonishingly i mean really like, shockingly good lucky both <laughs> young and old it's it's weird. It's one of those performances where I find when she's still uh, being held by uh, by Kananga's grip, she's more interesting. Like the first time she meets Bond underneath the filet of so, I know who you are, why you've come, and 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 where you. I don't know what the other thing is. And Bond is like, isn't it a little presumptuous? And given we we've only just met, you know, they do have almost a more interesting repartee when she's being. The high priestess solitaire, as opposed to when she's liberated. She's actually more boring when she's liberated. She feels like a child when she's liberated. It's really because she's so young, and even Roger Moore, about 20 years older than her, it, it, it really. It, it's which, make, which makes that bedroom scene a little bit weird. It, it, it really. Uh, it's a little bit creepy. Like, he looks young, but he doesn't look like he's the same age as she is. Although there's a darn good line in that one, too. You know, uh, lover's lesson number one and lover's lesson number two. Is the time before we go for lesson number three? And she, well, of course, there's no, no sense in going out half cocked. <laughs> That's, I don't know. Again, I will keep on delivering these lines until we're done recording. No, no, Roger Moore, can, can, top form here. The direction and the script failed this movie. Well, speaking of the, let's talk a little, a, a little bit about the script and more specifically the villain's plot. We talked about the villain and how much we like him and, and the actor playing, and we haven't really talked about his plot. Now we, we give a lot of love to the Bloody Morgan plot of the book. What about this one here in the film? It's the same as any, 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 any drug dealer. Get, get the first thesis free. After you got a paint, it's a little underwhelming. It's really underwhelming. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't feel very befitting of a Bond film even even sanchez in license kill he's going after sanchez because of some very personal things and also sanchez sanchez's did. operation is more complex he yeah there's a whole missile rockets or whatever they are whereas kananga it, it really is just overtaking the heroin market that's pretty much it and but this lair, is, which is very evil his but. lair is like k-mark <laughs> lair i i 
<laughs> like I, I actually like, can I say kind of like it? I like the fact that it's underneath the voodoo ceremony ground. Come on, and, you ha- oh, you had the, the oh, is this from the world of James Bond? Book? Yeah, I yeah. have that book, but I, I you have he's got his own mono. Uh, come on, you whoa, whoa, he's got whoa, his own Blofeld, monorail. Blofeld had a monorail inside a volcano. This guy has a shack in underground. It's not a shack. It's a you got a shark pool. A shark pool. Uh you have a you have a a, a little. Uh, Office space. Office space where they, a, where you can have champagne. He offers shit. He offers Bond and, and solitaire. He offers Bond and solitaire. She betrayed him. She, he gives him some champagne. Her some champagne. Have these missile silo thingies that they use to transport the cocaine, uh, the heroin in. Yeah, it's not and it li- and it's all located above this, which we haven't talked about. These this crazy voodoo ground where they have these sacrifices. Mm-hmm. That's actually one of where one of the MI six agents dies at the start. <laughs> it's not the Hmm. It's not I the know. best enemy it, layer, but I, I kind of like it. I kind of like it. <laughs> you know what it reminded me of? Um, I haven't seen that movie in decades now, but do you remember in the 1990s movie um, adaptation of The Phantom with Billy Zane? Ooh, I, I think... It's an obscure reference. I'm probably... Uh, the only I, person I know remember. what you're talking about, but I, I don't have many memories well, of it. Well, the end of that movie, uh, the villains have a similar layer where they have a shark pool... But that shark pool is a river, and it's about as wide as your. If you spread your arms, <laughs> this is as like it's incredibly small. I'm like, okay, uh, th- you know that the shark is probably gonna die. Like, you can't turn around. He's just gonna you gotta kill a shark. What, what, it, uh. It's animal cruelty. It's really cruel. See, that's where Doctor Kananga is superior. It's I mean, a nice. It's a calm pool. They're regularly fed. Um, but that's their version of uh, the the book's version of the boat thing. They just he just yeah, ties them yeah. up together and dot. For a moment there, when you said there's the equivalent of the film, I had no idea what you were talking about. But that's what you're talking about. Yes. Like, it's only when I rewatch it, having read the books recently, I'm like, oh my god, it is in the, the film, but it's really it, it. The problem, like I'm gonna say it. It's a lack of funds. I mean, they, they did that scene. Uh, not even ten years later, they did that, this, that, that exact scene in "For Your Eyes Only." Yep. So, it, and that's an awesome scene. It's a great scene. I mean, there is uh, prudence to how the, these movies are made. After uh, Honor Majesty's Secret Service, they were going always bigger, bigger, bigger. And when Majesty didn't perform, they went lower, mm. and they stayed around seven million for couple of years and it shows this movie uh at times it and they changed the ratio i don't know if you noticed that i did that it, it's a one eight five instead of two uh, two three five yeah, i think yeah it, it hurts the film those films are made for bigger screens and all the mankowitz trilogy as you mentioned they they're all shot on that that same uh, ratio and it hurts the film yeah it is a little bit weird. not not that you can't make nice looking movies in in 1.85 but it's true that the 2.35 really uh there's something particularly cinematic yeah it's that widescreen uh panning that you can do that is very impressive especially in those I have to stop talking about majesties but those piss gloria the swiss alps i mean come on I've, but and uh, shut up shut up shut up <laughs> we'll get that when we got that um, now, sharks are not the only animal threat to James Bond in, in this film. What do you think of uh, you know, trespassers will be eaten? Which is there's like, there was actually a real Kananga personality behind that that sequence. But in the film, there's this little sequence where where he's brought to the farm, take Bond to the farm, which is kind of like take Bond to school. <laughs> so Tihi was this one of the many. We haven't mentioned him yet, but he he has these glass, very tall guy, kind of like Jeffrey Holder, but maybe not as imposing. He has this like hook hook hand, and they bring him to a an alligator farm where they're also where they're also preparing the heroin for that matter. And there's this scene where uh, they leave Bond on a little rock island in the middle of this pond lake pond lake. A pond lake. I think that's what they call them. And um, the alligators come to eat them. What, what do you think of that sequence? I think it's kind of fun. <laughs> it's the beginning of the boat chase in a way. Um, the, the watch has a magnet, but at first it fails, and he has to use his wits to get out. And well, and his balls. And his balls. Literally. But it's 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 a cool stunt it's a very cartoon like stunt he steps on on the crocodiles to escape are they crocodiles or alligators you can always tell an alligator by its round snout okay i didn't pay attention 
I'll, I'll call him Crocodile. So he steps on them to escape. It's it's a cool stunt. It's they it's done for real, and I love when they do stunts for real. But when you think about it, he didn't use his wits. It just step on them. I think it takes a little bit of wit to it takes there, there's, balls. There's, there's wit as far as cunning, and then there's like courage. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's courage. But I wish he came up with a clever solution. But there was. There's not a whole lot you got. I think that they sort of wrote themselves into a corner with that scene where there's not going to be anything terribly sophisticated. It's just going to be something like, oh my goodness, I can't believe he just dashed all on the snouts of like five or six alligators or, or crocodiles. crocodiles. We're not sure. Probably alligator, crocodile, all in a row uh, in sequential order. But no, it's a super ballsy stunt. I get what you're saying. And it's a fair point, point taken. It doesn't personally doesn't detract from that sequence. I like no, it a lot. No, it's, it's 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 still impressive. Another great line just before Tihi leaves him, he explains how <laughs> old Albert there took my whole arm off. Well done, Albert. Yeah. <laughs> just I get. There's another non-stop, one that nonstop. He, he, today they wouldn't have accepted that animal activists would have been uh, uh, up in arms because uh, oh he steps on uh, crocodiles blah blah blah. Which is, is which I, is a fair point to I, me. I don't know how sensitive and I know I, I I myself I am a great admirer of the of the animal of the animal kingdom. I'm such I'm such an admirer of the animal kingdom. I don't understand the concept of zoos. Why don't we just leave them in the jungle and don't get near them? But anyway, that's just me. I don't know how sensitive animal activists are. Like if they film that, I mean they're they're croc. They have strong snouts. Does that hurt them? I, I'm not a crocodile or, look, or an alligator. I don't know if that hurts them. They don't look happy. I don't think they. they, they I don't think that's. I don't think that's right. But anyway, they still did it. It's a cool moment. It's a little bit weird. Um, I don't think people would. Uh, well, things with animals these days, very very careful. Was, you know, the CG Komodo dragon in Sky yeah. Fog. They were never going to use a real no. dragon. It was going to be a CG creature. So. I'm just going to say it. Roger Moore is James Bond for kids most of the time. Whether. It's right for Sleeping there to be... Sleeping with that many women? Sleeping with that many women? Is he, is he kids don't get... The thing that kids are going to gravitate towards to and what adults are going to notice are two different things. You can show a kid movie to an adult and a kid movie to a kid. They're not the same thing are going to uh, grab their attention. I, I recently watched Coco and many adults came out of that movie crying because mm. the, the, the subject of the movie being with family and death and uh, not being forgotten it touched a lot of people's heart but kids didn't because of their was colorful was, cartoon for them. just colorful cartoons mm-hmm. action fun great time but adults were like it's an emotional movie even i there at times some sniffles in the audience i i had once so i think kids as a kid i love roger moore uh, as a teenager eventually i disown roger moore i'm gonna be honest I, 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 there's a part of me where i was like oh it doesn't work like especially um, in the 90s with uh, pierce brosnan it's like, oh, it's the perfect James Bond. It's Sean Connery and uh, Roger Moore mixed together. That's how you do Bond. That's right. That's right. And as a kid, I I, I'm, I must admit, I preferred Roger Moore because his adventures were more extravagant. Mm. His stunts were more cartoonish. Everything was oh, a little sure. bit more cartoonish. And so is that stunt. The, the crocodile stunt is a cartoon. <laughs> like, it is. It is. Bugs Bunny would do the same thing. And I'm like, okay, that's... That's correct. I think it's a very sophisticated point about the fact that children will recognize, they will be entertained and enthralled for different reasons than, than the adults. But maybe that's why I, I, I love Roger so much. When I was younger, the weird parts of the movies entertained me, <laughs> and still do to large degrees. And now when I'm an adult, the, I get other things out of So I still love Roger, yeah. but maybe for slightly different reasons. We have a Felix Slater, one of many. I was shocked to see him. I don't know if you... You were I, I I knew he was in this movie, but I've seen License to Kill more often than than. Well, like, you're a Timmy guy. Yeah, I'm a Tim guy. But I was shocked how young he looked, and I was I love their repartee. It's I, good, isn't it? Yeah. I'm I'm. It sucks that he's not in the movie more, and that th- there's never been like an action movie with with James Bond and Felix, Felix Slider back to back, like fighting bad guys. There's never they've never done it in any movies. Which is well, I guess maybe it's weird because they never seem to be able to settle on a Felix Slater. So the audience yeah. is un- unless you're, but even if you're a diehard like you or me, like the joke about Felix Slater is that it's never the same guy. <laughs> <laughs> so we like Felix Slater because of the weird reasons. You know, uh, Tom, Dick, and Jane. It's like who's Felix Slater? Yeah. And oh, he's been in like 15 movies. I don't remember him. You don't remember him because it's never the same guy. You know. But I, it would be kind of cool if they, um, hey. You got to bring back Jeffrey Wright. 
Bond 25, bring back Jeffrey. We yeah. want Jeffrey. I vote for him. But I agree. F uh, David Hedison, uh, the actor who plays Felix here, is, is very, very good, very entertaining, very charming. He yeah. kind of is the fe the lighter of the Felix of the book is like blonde and, and, and from Texas. And I, I don't know where David Hedison is from, and he's certainly not blonde, but personality wise. I think he's he, from New Jersey, I think. He, he kind of feels like the Felix lighter from the book. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he's very. Yeah, you know, Bond blows stuff up left and right, but he's not too angry about it. Yeah, he's a good guy, Bond. He's having a know. good time. He seems to be having a good time, despite it all. Yeah. Not dark or uh, as intense as Jeffrey Wright. Jeffrey Wright just looks angry all the time. <laughs> well, certainly in Quantum of Solace. I do. Yeah, he's given a good performance there, but th his Felix from Casino. <laughs> God. Yes. Friend, give me one of those. Hold the fruit. <laughs> You're, I'm your brother from Langley. I feel there is one thing we should talk about and i think i saw it in your notes somewhere thank thank goodness you come with notes matthew <laughs> it, it's the first bond film not scored by uh, john barry uh, well actually you know what i'm wrong monty norman did heavy no, work on the rock no we there's that's another that's another bonus podcast um he was not involved at all right which which makes it exciting because it's a fresh take on it's the very possible. groovy. It's, it's noticeable. Yeah, hell yeah, it's noticeable. And again, sort of like how we, we sort of started this episode by saying this is kind of like the black exploitation bond. It's kind of the black exploitation bond score as well. So obviously, it's a time capsule. They're never going to use that music in any of the other films, nor would they have used it before necessarily. I'm not going to lie. That is one of my favorite bond scores. That, oh yeah, it's the fifth Beatle that did it. He, the fifth genius, as I would uh, describe him. I mean, it's it's so cool. George Martin. I, I love his, his score. Sometimes it's a little bit too noticeable. It's a little bit too, like, groovy. But at the same time, the negative are outweighed by the positive. Because it's a great... Uh, it fits with the song. It, it it just creates a musical environment, universe. You, you talk of a musical universe. I don't know if you did that intentionally. The Live and Let Die song... Appears in, in the, the universe. Yes, I, I wrote it in my notes. It's actually <laughs> that's good. I like that, and and I've heard through other other podcasting brethren of ours that the singer. Unfortunately, her name escapes me. But the singer in that scene in the Louisiana in the New Orleans filet of soul, she was going to that was going to be her version in the title sequence. Of course, they got Paul McCartney of all people. And God bless Paul McCartney. I love Living the Die, his song. But man, that singer in the Filet of Soul, she freaking belts out Living Let Die. I, I have to admit, my favorite rendition of that song was by Guns N' Roses. There's, their rendition is awesome. I should learn to talk into the mic. I'm going to stop turning these pages. <laughs> um, I, you know, I may have, I don't know where I thought. I could have sworn it was in your notes, but anyways. Um, you know, I like that rendition a lot. It's, it's a really... Uh, kick ass rendition. It's like well, it's not heavy metal. It's like the hard rock. No, it's a version. air metal version. Air metal version. There you go. But I, I think because it's a, it's a very different version, which is good. You know, you want to reinvent certain things when you're going to cover something. Um, but the version at that filet of so, and she like she's looking at Bunce and she's almost pointing at him, mm -hmm. and he's like, "What's going on? Why are you so intent on looking at me?" Whoop. <laughs> and that's underneath. that's a part that's also in the novel when he's at there at the club and the well the same thing happens to Felix and James Bond they get um, sucked in the ba the bowels of the of a club. Why don't you like the Why don't you like a booth? I had a bad turn in one once. <laughs> Again, I'm just gonna keep on coming out with these. Oh, the, the score, very good score. What do you think of the um, the James Bond theme? I think it starts kicking in when. Uh, little the taxi cab driver Ku Klux Klan Ku Klux is driving him into Harlem uptown that's where like this live and let die version of the Bond theme kicks oh, in it's a group. pretty cool uh, it's also the the gun barrel sequence yes that's true the same music does play in the gun barrel sequence Paul he turns that's another bonus episode but why not he, he, he turns he shows the camera um, it's the ratio. I, I much prefer the version he does for the Spy uh, Who Love Me, where it's wider and he's wearing a tux. I I love my James Bond wearing a tux, looking proper. Uh, the only ones who haven't worn a tux are um, Sean, 
I think George, I guess. Think, isn't he wearing a, a tux? Would he wear a tux? Would, would he wear a tux with a top hat? Oh, no, it's, it's not a top hat, but, but whatever. I think it's a tux. I'm not, I'm not going to be sure. So we'll say no. We'll say no. So Sean, um, George, don't wear the tux. Roger, Pierce, Timothy Dalton all wore a tux. But Daniel Craig is just wearing a suit. And the way he walks, I hate his gun bow. He just looks like a grumpy old man. He is a grumpy old man. He doesn't want those those goddamn suits that he wears are so tight. He probably can't even like turn properly. Probably has a stunt coat. For but a we should do a bonus episode on some articles from the suits of Bond. <laughs> yeah. He does comment on that. I've read one of our articles where it says, like, the suits inspector look really nice, but they don't fit him, you know. No, they do. The, Which is a fair point. It's a fair, they, they look too tight, inspector. It's ridiculous. I mean, those dude. As much as the the um, some of the suits that Timothy Dalton look baggy, uh, they went the other way with Tim- Daniel Craig. He looks like he's wearing somebody's. Uh, I think I just discovered a, a real bon- bonus episode. Not not we should probably do a bonus episode on what Bond wears, you know, <laughs> of uh, course, and just our likes and dislikes. Because I have, I'm I'm not a I'm not a clothing connoisseur. But, uh, b- back to uh, back to <laughs> Live and Let Die. What are we talking about today? All oh, right, Live and Let Die the movie. Yeah, we need to wrap this. We up. need to wrap the wrap this baby up. So, I mean, I think we hit most of the points. Bond, the villains, the girl, the locations. Oh, just, I need. We need to mention this. Yes, go ahead. Solitaire. At sometimes she looks like Queen Amidala from the prequels. Yes, I know. I mentioned it to you, but I had to say it, so it's on. But we need the listeners to understand this as well. Yeah. So every time all those fanboys go back and watch the Phantom Menace for the two hundredth time. They get to think about a Bond film instead, a much better film. Mm-hmm. Despite any reserv- reservations you and I might have about this movie, better movie, Live and Let Die. More coherent and better acted? Yeah. No, oh, I'm telling you, that better acted. Better better dialogue? Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. You know what I noticed? The scene where, we haven't talked about Rosie Carver, although she doesn't play a huge role, but the scene where Rosie Carver and Bond are in their little hotel room and uh, she she goes. I'm gonna change in the, in the bathroom or whatnot. She screams. There's a sn- sn- snake. Oh, I forgot to tell you. Never go in there without a mongoose. What <laughs> happens at the start of Casino Royale in Madagascar? Mongoose. mongoose and a snake fight. Mm. But uh, yeah, maybe we should start thinking about uh, wrapping things yeah. up a little bit. Um, so final, final thoughts. thoughts? Final, oh. Oh, hey, great minds think alike. Again, I like it quite a bit. I've agreed on some of the negatives with you. Yes, last night was unfortunately the first time where I thought the film was a little long. I'm going to blame the fact that I was fatigued, um, not the film. But it, it's not perfect. It's not my favorite, Roger. Uh, we'll rank them at some point in the future, but I, I do enjoy it uh, very, very much. Yeah, uh, I, th- I think I have similar feeling. It's, 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 a, a, it's a good movie to a point, where can we be found online? Uh, the, it, <clears throat> excuse me. I, uh, Edgar, can be found at uh, on Twitter at double underscore O-H underscore pop, double O pop, Matthew. Uh, Matt O'Clara. We have the official podcast Twitter account at the James Bond Complex. Uh, I've got a Facebook page, the James Bond Complex uh, slash, I don't know. I, you use Facebook more than me. Facebook slash Bond Complex. Just type down the James, the James Bond, Bond Complex. complex. Uh, we've got an Go email to the jadesbondcomplex dot com, and uh, I, I, as I believe we've been saying for a few episodes, we are working on a website. The fingers are crossed as I'm saying this. When this is going to be released at some point in the future, there shall be the www. It dot should James already be there. Uh, if we did our job, it's already yes. there. As you are listening to this, there is a triple W. We're in the complex. past. You're in the future right now. Right, exactly. Um, so that's all for us on this episode. But do not worry because James Bond will return in Moonraker. No. No. I have a, we're doing something special. We're doing a bonus episode. Good Lord. Good Lord. Uh, have you forgotten about the comic books? Comic books? Comic books. Or bo- James Bond comic books? Yes. Yes, I read one this morning, actually. James Bond will return in Vargo. <laughs> Varger. Varger? Varger. 2015 slash 2016, I guess. Tata, merci à la prochaine. À plus tard.